he had left the church in the hands of a young man named Timothy. And the letter that he writes is a letter of encouragement. Paul wants to encourage these, this young pastor who, who seemingly needs, needs some encouragement, but he wants him to continue to serve God faithfully. But not only is it an encouraging letter, it's also a letter of instruction. There are many, many instructions found in 1 Timothy, and Paul writes to uh, him to continue to grow, to continue to stand for the truth, because there will be opposition. I don't care where a pastor is or who he is or where he serves, if you serve God, you will face opposition from time to time, or maybe all the time. But uh, in these verses that we're going to read, uh, we're going to watch Paul, we're, we're we're going to watch him give his testimony. And I'm going to focus on that. What, what is a testimony? It's our story. It, this is Paul's story, and he's going to use his testimony. And in doing so, he's going to show us the praise of God's grace. Uh, it's an awesome, awesome testimony. So let's consider verse 12 all the way through 17. And I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Who was, I was, before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant, with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, worthy, worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners. Can I get an amen? amen. Of which the Apostle Paul says, I am the chief sinner. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first... Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Now unto the King eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever, and may I add, ever and ever, in Jesus' name, amen. Father, help us to receive your word. We give you all the glory, all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. If God can take a man like Paul and turn him around and remake his life, that's a message that ought to be preached. In essence, when Paul gives his testimony, he's saying, look at me, Timothy. You need encouragement? Take a look at my life, at what Jesus has accomplished in and through me. Now, if God could do that, if God could save Paul by his grace and use that kind of man with that kind of history and that kind of past, then I want to tell you, we all should be encouraged. There's hope for all of us. The point is that Jesus made a difference in Paul's life, and what he accomplished for Paul is possible for any. And that ought to be preached. And he says, Timothy, that ought to encourage you. And you ought to use it for God's glory. We ought to um, not, not only use this as our testimony to lost people, but we ought to use our testimony as Paul's doing right here. It's not only to the lost, but he's also giving his testimony for us. We who are saved. That God is not finished with any of us yet. And if he were, we would already be in heaven. But as long as we're on earth, God is still working on me and God is still working on you. And that is a message of grace. I want to focus first on this testimony. I call it the testimony of grace. Notice how he starts in verse 12. He says, I thank God. How often do you give God thanks? How often 
and I'm not talking about just superficially, but how are you really thankful for what God has done? Do you show it to Him? Do you express it to Him in your prayer time? Is it mostly asking for something else, or do you give Him thanks for what He's done? You see, thankfulness is an attitude that is developed. It's developed over time. There are not some people who got it so good that they're just automatically thankful. No, you have to work at it. It is something you have to, um, it's a discipline in our lives. And God is looking for some thankful people because I want to tell you, God has accomplished a whole lot in a room just like this as I look around. And that's not only what he has done, but we know what he can do and what he is going to do. Let me tell you one thing he's going to do. Jesus is going to come again. And for that, I give God thanks. Thank you, Lord, for the salvation that I have bought and paid for by your precious son on the cross. I see this testimony of grace, and the first thing I notice is, Paul gives thanks to God. His testimony is all about how God had worked in his life, and all of us have a testimony. We ought to be quick to share it. As I said a moment ago, not only with the lost, but also with those who might need encouragement, those who are saved. Uh, They might just need a lift up. But your testimony and my testimony, first and foremost, like his, it ought to start with, I thank God. No matter what happens today or what's going to happen tomorrow, God is worthy of our thanks. The Apostle Paul begins it just like that. He gives thanks to the Lord. Listen, when your life has been touched by God's grace, and if you know Jesus Christ, it has. By grace are ye saved. If your life has been touched by the grace of God, you ought to be filled with thanksgiving. I like this thought. The heart of the gospel, the heart of the message of Jesus Christ is that God has shown all of us abundant grace. So why don't we see grace operate all around us? Why so often do we see humanism, human effort, human hum, people trying to look good themselves, showing themselves off, putting others down, when in fact the church ought to be lifting everybody up because we all are saved by grace. When our lives have been touched by God's grace, we ought to be filled with thanksgiving. Grace and thanksgiving go together like breathing. Every time we take a breath, we're breathing in by grace. Every breath you take is grace. And when you're breathing in grace, you ought to be exhaling thanksgiving. Amen or oh my. The reason so many today in our world, we look around, what's wrong, preacher? I I, want to tell you one of the main things wrong. Unthankful people. Unthankful for what they have. Unthankful for how good they've had it. And God's about to give us a lesson, I believe. The reason so many are unthankful, unhappy, and unholy is because they refuse to acknowledge God's grace. Now, some are lost, and they've rejected grace. But here's the one that really bothers me. Others who claim to know Jesus Christ and act like the devil. If you're living and breathing grace, you'll be exhaling thanksgiving. So it's a litmus test for all of us. Am I living in grace? How often are you giving God thanks? How often do you thank Him for your salvation? How often 
Do you look at others down your nose and down your crooked little eyeballs? Or do you see God in all of his mercy and what he can do? Paul's testimony of grace was filled with thanksgiving. In verse 12, also, we're going to stay with verse 12 for just a moment. That's the first thing that jumps out. But he also gives God all of the glory. Have you ever met someone who talked about themselves more than they ought? We've all met people like that. They think of themselves a little higher than they ought. When in fact, in all of our lives, if it weren't for God, we would be nothing. I am what I am by the grace of God. That's the Apostle Paul's story, and it's our story. He says, I thank God, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, you ought to underline that, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, put him into the ministry. Now, God didn't look at Paul and say, that's a good man. God looked at Paul and said, I know what I can do with that man. The only thing about the Apostle Paul that's any different is that at some point, he surrendered to the Lord Jesus Christ. It was on the Damascus Road. You remember the story. It was not easy. God had to beat him down a little bit. Can I get an amen? Amen. And some come to the Lord quite quickly, and others come a little slower. God got, got his attention on that Damascus road, and he gives God all of the glory. He says, listen, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, my Lord, Because, number one, he enabled me, and he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. This this man, Saul, could not completely figure it out how God can take a man like that and turn him around and put him on the right road. I don't know where you are this morning, but I want to tell you, my God, there is nothing impossible with him. All things are possible with God. It does not mean that every prayer of ours is going to be answered the way we want. But I will tell you this, if you're God's child, He has a plan for your life and for mine. And one day we're going to be in heaven, we're going to look back this direction, and we're going to say, man, it was worth the ride. It was worth it. When our lives have been touched by God's grace, not only we ought to be filled with thanksgiving, but we're giving God the glory. Paul gives God the glory for his calling. Notice he says, he enabled me, saying that the reason he was serving the Lord the day that he wrote this is because God is the one that put him in the ministry. Paul didn't choose to go into the ministry. He didn't plan on becoming a preacher and an apostle. But God had plans for his life. Isn't it wonderful when God gets a hold of us and turns us around and puts, him, puts us on his path? When Paul was placed there, he served faithfully, and he did it all for the glory of God. And the same is true for you and I. The Lord chooses our place of ministry. Now, I want to tell you, we, we go to church in America... Grown up in church, many of us. If you belong to Jesus Christ, God has a call and a ministry for you. It's that simple. The church is a body, a variety of spiritual gifts. Everyone in this room that knows Jesus Christ as their personal Savior, God has gifted you at your conversion, at your point of salvation. The Holy Spirit has given you a talent, a gift. Call it what you will. It is a powerful thing He's given you to serve the Lord. 
how are you doing with your gift? Some people don't even know what their gift is. Paul gives God the glory. We're talking about he not only was thankful, but he gives God all the glory. He says, I thank God for the fact that he put me in the ministry, and I thank God that he called me as an apostle and as a preacher. I doubt if anybody that's human would have picked the Apostle Paul. Can I get an amen? I don't think anybody in this room, if we were nominating and knew who Saul of Tarsus was and what he did, I don't believe any of us would have picked him. But God did, and aren't you thankful? Two-thirds of the New Testament written by his hand. God can turn a man around, and when he does, look out. He can turn a woman around. God gets the glory for his gift. God gets the glory for his calling. And notice in verse 12 again, God gets the glory for his strength. Now, the Apostle Paul became a powerful man. But it wasn't his power, it was Jesus' power. This is a man surrendered to the Lord. He says, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who hath enabled me. He counted me faithful, put me into the, mer- in, into the ministry. And so God is enabling him for the task that he's asking him to do. Wherever God calls you, He will provide for you. When God calls a church to a ministry, He will provide for that ministry. And that's exactly what Paul is saying. I'm not the preacher or teacher or an apostle by anything of myself. It's not anything about education. It's not anything about intellect. It's not anything about Natural ability. It's about what Jesus can do. And what he did was all by the power of God. So what's the lesson? None of us ought to fear where God's going to lead us. None of us ought to be afraid of what God may call us to do. Because wherever he calls us, he will supply all that we need. The Apostle Paul understood that. His testimony of grace is filled with thanksgiving. He gives God the glory. And thirdly, about this point, he does not conceal his past. Now, I want to tell you, I see a lot of people, and they try to hide everything that they see as wrong in their past. And I'm not talking about bragging about your past. Heavens, I've seen some people brag about some of the sin in their life. I'm not talking about that either. But I am not ashamed of what God has done in my life. This is the Apostle Paul saying, I know who I was, but I also know who I am. I know where I was, and I see where I am, but I know where I'm going. And it's all by the grace of God. When you preach this, when you teach this, when you model this, People will want to know what the secret is. And the secret is Jesus Christ. Paul tells us that he was a blasphemer. Look at verse 13, a persecutor, injurious. You know what that means? This, by his own admission, he was guilty of breaking all the commandments. As a blasphemer, he had spoken evil of and slandered the Lord Jesus Christ. By the way, he's God. Amen or oh my. As a persecutor and as an injurious man, he's guilty of murder. He's guilty of hatred. He's guilty of unspeakable acts of cruelty to the very people of God. But God got a hold of him. And that's what grace can do. Paul was a sinful man. He didn't hide it. He shared it. 
and he said, that's who I was, but this is who I am. I'm guilty before the Lord, but praise be to God that I believe in the blood of Jesus Christ. And when the blood, we sing, there is power, power, wonder-working power. Do you really believe it? There's power in the blood. Wonder-working, life-changing power. Paul understood that. When he surrendered to Christ, there was nothing. There was nothing he could do before that to please God. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 7 and 8. He's writing to the church at Rome in, in, in this letter. And listen to what he says about the man without Christ trying to please God. He says, because of the carnal mind, that's the mind without Christ. That's the fleshly mind. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God. Did you catch that? When we're in our flesh, we are the enemy of God. In reality, we don't like Him. He loves us, amen, but He doesn't love the way we are, and He cannot, he cannot come into our lives when there's sin all in us. That sin must be covered. That the blood must cover our sin. And he says the carnal mind is enmity against God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now the religious person ought to take notice of this. They think by doing this and doing that and not doing this and not doing that, God is certainly pleased with me. I want to tell you, it's enmity against God. In essence, when someone tries to go to heaven without Christ, they're spitting on the cross. They're saying, my works are good enough. When in fact, our works are like filthy rags. And it's all because of Jesus' payment on the cross. The only way I can please God, the only way you can please God, is to submit. Now, that's a nasty word, isn't it, in our day? Wives, submit unto your husbands. Boy, don't want to hear that one. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. The first part of 1 Corinthians 11, we're going to go to the 28th verse here in just a minute for the Lord's Supper, but you ought to go read the first part. Mm. There's a certain authority that God has placed because he's God. And so this carnal mind, this carnal world in which we live in, the only way out, uh, the, the only true way to please the Lord is first by receiving his son, Jesus Christ. It starts right there. Romans 10, verse 9 and 10. If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead you will be saved. Not might be. Not hope you will be. You will be. Because, listen to what he goes, for with the heart man believes in the righteousness unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Salvation is a gift. And it's a gift of grace. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 8, For by grace are you saved through faith, not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Not of works, lest any man should boast. But look at verse 10. For we are his workmanship. You know what God does when you get saved? When you come to Jesus Christ, God goes to work on your behalf. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So Paul's testimony is filled with thanksgiving. It's a testimony of grace. It's filled with thanksgiving. He gives God all of the glory. He does not even attempt to conceal his past. He gives it all to God and says, God be glorified. Now, that's the testimony of grace. I want you to see the abundance, the abundance of grace. Verse 14, and the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant. I'm going to focus on that. Paul wants us to see this. Abundance a good word, amen? It means a bunch. But what does he mean when he says it's exceeding abundant? 
It's bigger than you could ever imagine. God's grace is greater. It's abundant. It's exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying, worthy of all acceptation. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Paul tells us that the grace that he was preaching is a grace that sought him out, and it bought him. It came to him. It was exceedingly abundant. It means that God has more grace than you will ever need. Amen? God's grace abounds. When sin abounded, Paul would write to the Romans, God's grace did much more abound. And so the gospel is a, the heart of it. The gospel is a gospel of grace. God can take any person, no matter who they are, where they come from, and turn their life around because Jesus' blood is powerful. He tells us there are two gifts, two great gifts. You know, if you're saved this morning, say amen. amen. You know the Lord. Here are two great gifts that should cause you to offer God thanks any day, any time, at all times. Grace and mercy. Have you ever looked at those two words? Grace is getting what you didn't deserve. Paul deserved to go to hell. But God's abundant grace sought him out. And God turned him around. Paul was not even, Saul was not even looking for God. Can I get an amen? God was looking for him. And by the way, if the Holy Spirit has been talking to you, if you're here this morning, I would suggest that the Holy Spirit's given you a second chance. Today is the day of salvation. You cannot play with God. And so Paul is saying that the condemnation of hell that he deserved, he didn't get. But by grace, God gave him the perfect salvation that he did not deserve. And mercy, mercy is not getting what he did deserve. Two words go hand in hand. Mercy held off the wrath of God when Paul was persecuting the church, blaspheming the name of of God's one and only Son, in whom God was well pleased, blaspheming the gospel, blaspheming God and his people, the Christians that followed him. But it was grace that came to him. It came to Saul on that Damascus road and said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? When Paul says that he obtained mercy, I love that phrase. There's a song, I, I can't remember which it is, but I, it's a contemporary song um, about mercy finding us. We didn't look for mercy, but mercy found me. And that's what it means right there. When Paul says he obtained mercy, I understand in the original language, it's in the passive tense, which simply means he wasn't looking for it. God, uh, Paul did not seek mercy, but mercy found him. He did not deserve mercy, but mercy came to him. He did not even understand mercy. But mercy found him. Thanks be unto God for his unspeakable gift. Because grace is abundant. Someone says to you, how do you know you're going to heaven? Well, I know I'm going to heaven by the word of God. I cannot understand people who seemingly have been with God for 50 years and say something like, I don't even know if God exists. That's astounding to me. I may go through trials like Job. Probably not because God used Job as an example. Amen. But I, I, I want to tell you, there's nothing on this earth that heaven won't cover. Eternity. If God can save Paul, he can save anyone. Um... 
I'm going to heaven by the word of God. I'll tell people all day long. And I want to tell you something else. I'm not even going by the skin of my teeth. I'm going by the powerful grace of Almighty God. And that is a wonderful thing. Two great statements right here. Uh, maybe you ought to write them down. If God can save Paul, no one's out of reach. And also, here's the second one, and this is one I want to focus on. I realize we're about out of time. But the way God saved Paul, catch this. Do not miss this. The way that God saved Paul, by grace, is a pattern, a scriptural pattern that God wants us to take notice of. He says that right here. Look at, look at what he says. i, I got to find that verse. Uh, we are saved to be trophies of grace. He says, how be it for this cause I obtain mercy... That in me, first, Jesus Christ might show forth all long suffering. That's patience. Can I get an amen? Now, what's all that for? It's for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe on him. That's you and me. Paul says, God, and this abundant grace and this past that he's dealt with in my life, look at what God has done, and it ought to be a pattern. That everyone who believes would follow. Because when you're filled with grace, remember the abundance, love and truth comes with it. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10, we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. And then Matthew chapter 5 verse 16, Jesus himself, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. I close it up with not only this pattern of grace, not only the, uh, the abundance of grace and the testimony of grace, but we're going to close with the title, The Praise of Grace. I want you to notice verse 17. It's a wonderful, wonderful verse. Paul remembered what he was before Jesus and all that Jesus had done for him. And when he considers it all, he cannot hold back his anthem of praise. Look at it. The praise of grace, verse 17. Think not that I am... Com no, this is... Uh, that's the wrong one. I'm sorry. Sorry about that. Let me get there. Now unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God. After all this preaching, all this testimony of grace, the praise of grace is coming out. In verse 17, he closes the whole thing after saying, The way God saved me is a pattern to all of those who will come hereafter that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's all going to be by grace. It's by grace we are saved. He says, now, because of all that, unto the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. You know why there's not any praise in the church? We need to be filled with God's grace. When God fills you up with grace, you can't help but break into song. Look at the doxology he, he just gives there. To the... To the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only wise God, be honor and glory. Give him honor. Give him glory. He's worthy in Jesus' name. Father, we love you. We thank you. I pray, oh Lord, for myself. Boy, Lord, you know my heart. I can be the most legalistic son of a gun. On planet earth. The knucklehead of all knuckleheads. Lord I see what you. Did in the apostle Paul. And it's an example for me. 
Help me, Lord. Lead me. Guide me. Make Thanksgiving be on my lips every day. Let me enjoy each day. It's a gift. All that you've done is good. Let me not take anything for granted. Help me, Lord, to look to you and to you alone, to lean on you and you alone. And help me, Lord, to preach to your church. Truly, that revival can come. I give you all the praise, all the glory. It all goes to you. In Jesus' name, amen. We're all going to stand and going to give a quick invitation. If you don't know Jesus Christ and you want to take this meal with us, we'll come to Jesus today and we welcome you. Um, if God's touched your heart, you need to come, please come. Today's the day of salvation. Perhaps the Lord comes this afternoon. Perhaps he comes now. I don't know and you don't know. But we stand here today and you've heard the word of God. You respond to him as we sing. close music playing softly um, that song really says it all are you willing to let God have his way I remember one point in my life I said to the Lord Lord I've tried it my way I didn't work out so good if you'll take me where I am Lord here I am use me about three years later God called me to preach who'd have ever thought don't go to my hometown and ask my old buddies. They'll probably tell you things you don't want to hear. I got a pass. But you know what? So do you. So does everyone in this room. But let me close this by telling you about the Lord Jesus who can wipe away all of your sin. As far as the east is from the west, he removes it. And we are made right before God. God is great. God's mercy is abundant. Praise be to God. One more line of this invitation. We close it. We go to the Lord's Supper as we sing. You need to come. The Lord's Supper uh, we're not talking about something that we just need to uh, get through quickly matter of fact uh, from time to time I make the Lord's Supper the whole focus of the message that morning maybe we ought to do it every time I, I don't know but this is something that Jesus himself instituted as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me. He did this with his disciples the night before he was crucified. And he said, until he comes again, we're to remember what he did, remember his body, remember his blood. And so it, it, it's a crucial time for the church. I, I, out of the ordinances, that means the rules, the laws that God has given, there's only two that he really gives to the New Testament church. It's to be baptized, and it's to observe this as often as you do it. Now, 
Paul, in writing to this church at Corinth, he says, you know, uh, when he starts out writing to him, he says, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not bragging on you guys. You guys need, need, by the grace of God, there's a lot of things you need to put together right because you got a lot of things wrong at Corinth. And it's not any different when you get to chapter 11 when he concerns the Lord's Supper. In verse 28, he, he says, um, well, 23, I'm sorry. For I received, he says, I, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, take, eat this is my body which is broken for you do this in remembrance of me and then in the same manner he took the cup um, after supper saying this cup is the new covenant the new testament 